Well, praise the Lord. Amen. 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 <laughs> wow. Let me uh, let me just real briefly before I before I bring the word of the Lord this morning. Uh, I, I, I want to share with you uh, some victories we're already seeing. Things that's already happening. Things that you, if you so choose, you can be a part of. Uh, some things that uh, this church is involved in that um, um, is reaching out in this community mm -hmm. to touch others with the with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the love of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I, I want you to know that that this this Sunday, Sunday morning is not the only thing that we do. Thank you for that. Sunday morning is not the only thing we do. And so um, we have something going on nearly every every day, every night. And uh, and we do it unto the glory of God. Uh, our, our mission statement at the Father's House is to make disciples. Disciples that make a difference. Not just converts, but disciples. <coughs> and so uh, we, we have... Throughout this week, we have actually probably, if you add all our groups together that meet during the week, we probably have more meetings during the week on the various nights if you add them all together than we have on Sunday mornings. And so that, that in and of itself is, uh, well, back there, I know we do. So we have a, a Bible study in, in, uh, in Spanish on Monday night for men and women. We have uh, praise and prayer here in, the, in, this, in this sanctuary on Tuesday nights at 6 o'clock where we just absolutely beseech heaven. Uh, for a spiritual awakening, uh, and not only in our church, but in our city, in our state, in our nation. And we pray specifically for a spiritual awakening, for revival, for, for a move of God that cannot be mistaken for anything other than God's doing. Uh, we have a Bible study on Wednesday morning for men. You're welcome to come to it at 6.30 a.m. Uh, be discipled in that. Uh, we have groups on Wednesday night at my house, uh, men and women. Uh, we have any, anywhere from uh, 20, to, 20 to 30 that come to that, adding, adding both groups together. Uh, sometimes it's down to 15, but sometimes as high as 30. just depends on the Wednesday night. And on Wednesday nights, we had, I think, we're, our youth, is, our, uh, our 3D youth running nearly 50, and our, the Rock is running nearly 40. Uh, so there's nearly 100 kids uh, from kindergarten through 12th grade on Wednesday nights, getting the Word of God. and uh, Then we have a, a, another group called JBQ, which our brother Daryl Roy heads up and teaches teaches children the Word of God, teaches them how to, uh, to know where play, things are in the Bible. They were they were going Saturday to a competition. Um, we, we have a, a Wednesday night Spanish church here also. This past Wednesday night, seven were saved. Amen, amen. amen. We had new faces. We combined that service, uh, the, the Spanish church, with ourselves this past Sunday. And I thought last Sunday was glorious and awesome. Amen. And, uh, and, and Maria and Romero wanted you to know that the people said that, uh, that came that only come on Wednesday nights. They said they, that we made them feel so welcome here. Amen. And so that was, that was your doing. It made them feel very welcome. And uh, so we praise God for that. Uh, we've just we've just got a lot a, a lot of a lot of uh, ministry going on, and uh, you can be a part of any of it. Uh, I want to give a shout out to the eight men, uh, eight including me, that that worked on the, the playground set on Saturday. If you thought that that playground set, we bought a new playground set. The old ones pulled up. We're putting a new one in, and uh, uh, you know I'm pretty I'm impatient when it comes to things like that. I saw that picture on the box of what it's supposed to look like. And I told men, let's do this in four hours. And uh, right. about seven hours later, we said, let's go home. <laughs> Let me lead into the message by saying this. Uh, the, the top of the message today is dealing with storms. Dealing with storms. And... Uh, when we unpacked four huge boxes, I mean those boxes, well, I don't know, Brother brother Joe, were they eight foot long, those boxes, and, uh, and, uh, and two feet wide, and just stuffed full of stuff, and, and there was uh, four boxes, and we, we unloaded it, there was a, a, a parts packing list in each box, and, and when we unpacked all that stuff, we did it, we thought, let's put as much together inside the fellowship hall as we can, where it's cool. 
and we'll build as much as we could inside and then carry it outside. We'll, we'll carry it out before it gets too big. We knew better than to build it inside that we'd never get out the door. <laughs> We unloaded all those parts and we did a parts inventory and we separated all the pieces that went together. They're, they're stamped on there with, you know, like M1, N1, O6, like a bingo game. The fellowship hall literally was completely covered the floor except when we were working with parts. We had two tables, six foot tables lined up with nothing but hardware in them. Ladies, you may not know what I mean by hardware. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Nuts and bolts and screws and those kind of things. Just laid down that two, two long tables and everything's numbered. And so as, I, as we got all inventory, we went, uh, we went through the list of things to make sure it was all there. If you'd have walked in the room at that moment, it would have looked like a storm had hit that room. It would have looked like a hurricane had tore down somebody's house or somebody's fort. And all the pieces were just laying all over the fellowship hall. I said, Lord Jesus, don't let Diana walk in right now. Because <laughs> there will be a storm in this room. <laughs> Just kidding. Diana. And so Diana our, is our wonderful, our wonderful uh, uh, cleaning lady. She's more than that. But she cleans our Amen. church. Ooh, excellent. Amen. Um, and so here's the thing. We've got, we've, got, we've got this picture on this box of what we know we're supposed to be putting together, but yet we've got all these pieces on the floor that don't look like that picture. So the, the journey or the process started of connecting the pieces in the right place in the right order to put together the picture that we were looking at. Paul said, I'll labor with you. The Apostle Paul said, I'll labor with you till Christ be formed in you. That's discipleship. We will labor with you until Christ be formed in you. That's discipleship. We're going to work. We're going to assemble the pieces and put them all together until Christ be formed in you. But how many of you know we have storms in our life? Many times those storms leave evidence of pieces laying around. Sometimes those pieces we cannot see in those pieces, in those, in those, in those places that, are, that look like they've been utterly dismembered or destroyed. Uh, uh, if you looked at the hurricane at, at, in the Bahamas after that hurricane leveled that one island, you know what I thought? I thought, dear Jesus, how are they going to put all that back together? But you know they will. They'll bring in They'll bring in bulldozers. They'll bring in and they'll, 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 they'll move out while needs to be moved out and rebuild. It, it, it'll happen. Even knowing there may be another storm in another year, they'll rebuild. I want to talk today about how to deal with storms. How to deal with storms. We're going to Romans, go to Romans chapter 7. We've got a lot of scripture to read here. But we're, we're going to read it out of the NIV. And... Uh, I think it'll be put up on the screen for you to see also. I'm going to be, begin at verse 18. I'm going to read Romans 7, 18 through 25, and then we're going to skip ahead to Romans 8, chapter 5, and verses 5 through 8, and Romans chapter 8. So here we go. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 18. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Think about that a moment. Though I want to do good, evil is right there with me. I'm sorry, I lost my place. It's about to come. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, 
waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I and myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And Paul is just saying, I've got this, I've got this conflicting battle going on in me. And he says, it says something interesting. He says, you know, if I continue to sin, but I have the Spirit of Christ, it's no longer I who sin. But that's a little bit confusing because we, we, we can't just blame it on, on something else. But he goes on to say, but it's the sin in me that's doing it. In other words, the new creation, the new man, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, your new man cannot sin. That's right. Your new creation, your new man is perfect. And he cannot sin. But you've got evil that's present with you. You've got the, 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 the nature of sin that is still present. And that wars against your spirit. The born again spirit of God in you. Your new creation. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. Those who live according to the flesh, that's that part of Paul's nature that he says is warring against the spirit, this, this struggle he has to sin, the, the evil that's present with him. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Amen. Yeah. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And so Paul said, I, I, I recognize that I have this, this struggle, this tension, this battle, this war among my members. He said, I, I, I hear God's voice. I hear his word. I know what to do. Because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Right. And so now there's always a storm that comes against the word of God. There's always a raging battle that comes when we've heard God speak. He said, I've got this war. It's, it's a storm. It's this raging battle. And it's that my mind is being, is being subjected to my flesh. So what sits between the, the lust of the flesh and the desire to do God's will, it is right between our ears, isn't it? That's right. That's right. It's right between our ears. It's our mind. It's how we think. It's our personality. It's our actions and reactions. <laughs> Paul says, the mind that's fixed on the flesh and its desires, that's an enemy of God. <clears throat> Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Now let me ask you a question. Does God always love you? Does it? Let me ask you this. Is he always pleased with you? No. Are you always pleased with yourself? No. I'm not either. I'm not always pleased with myself. Sometimes I'm very, I'm very much uh, displeased with myself. So I want to speak about a couple of things. Number one, the flesh is in no hurry to obey God's word. The flesh is in no hurry to obey God's word. In other words, it doesn't want to obey God's word. In John chapter 4 and verse 35, 
Jesus had been ministering to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, who he told her when she was drawing water, he said, you know, you could, have, you could ask me for a drink and I could give you water that would satisfy your thirst. You'd never have to draw again. And uh, she said, well, give me that water. Because she was thinking physically. But he was talking spiritually. And he ministered to her. He matter of fact, he tells her with, through a prophetic word of knowledge, he says to her, uh, he, he says, go get your husband. Already knowing that she doesn't have a husband. She says, well, I don't have a husband. He says, well, that's, you're, you've answered rightly. You've had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. Sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. In other words, where you've been looking to draw your water from, your life from, has always let you down. Or you've let them down. Whatever the case is. But he ministered to her and she, she recognizes that this one that's standing before her is a holy man of God. She doesn't have full understanding and full knowledge, but she runs to the back to the village from the well to tell them, to tell the village, you got to come see this man of God who told me everything about myself. Why? Because God knows us inside out. He knows everything about us. He created us, by the way. And um, as she's gone, these disciples who went into town to get food, they went somewhere to get food, they come back and and, uh, and and they find Jesus in really good. Uh, looks like he's looks like he's eight. He's got such energy. Anyways, in that there's a harvest that's about to take place in this town, this Samaritan village where this woman's from, and Jesus says to his disciples, verse thirty-five of John chapter four, "Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest." I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ripe for the harvest. Now, it's obvious that this was a, 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 a cliche or a proverbial saying, you might say, in this day and time. Because Jesus said, don't you have a saying? Four more months and then the harvest. It was a, it was a, a proverb with the idea that there's no particular hurry to do a particular task. There's no hurry to do it. In other words, it was a saying to excuse procrastination. You can just put it off. You can wait. But Jesus did not want his disciples to have this mentality. He wanted them to think and act as if the harvest was already here. That the word that when, when I speak. The writer of Hebrews, quoting the Old Testament, says, Today is your day of salvation. Today, if you will not harden your heart. For God, it's today. He's the I am. He's not the I was or the I will be. He's always in our present. He's the I am. It's easier to put things off. It's easier to let things go. But then minutes turn into days and days turns into weeks. And weeks turn into months and months into years. And we still haven't done the very thing that God spoke to us. The flesh is in no hurry to obey God's word. That's number one. Number two, your mind will gather evidence to support your flesh. Your mind will gather evidence to support your flesh. The flesh is in no hurry to do God's word. Matter of fact, it's enmity against God's word. Amen. And so when God speaks, He has to speak to our spirit. Our, our flesh can't comprehend it, nor no will it want to obey. So He'll speak to our spirit, our spirit man, our new creation, and He'll speak to us. Our flesh will say no, or can we do it later? Let's put it off. Did you really hear it? Are you sure that's what He said? The flesh, the flesh will immediately say no. That's right. Your flesh will always say no. That's 
Right. And so what happens is in our mind, the way that we, the, 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 that which our, our operating system starts to gather evidence to support the flesh. Instead of gathering evidence to support the spirit, your flesh will, I mean, your mind will gather evidence to support the flesh. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Paul says, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So the flesh, the flesh wants us to put off to tomorrow what God wants us to do today. The flesh always wants us to put it off, delay it, until our answer is no. Now your flesh, by the way, wants you to say no right at the start. How many of you ever said amen to something? Amen. You felt God speak to you. And you knew He's speaking to you. But then some minutes went by. The minutes turned into hours. And hours turned into a day. And, 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 and by Wednesday or by Tuesday or sometimes by Monday, sometimes by Sunday afternoon while God spoke to you on Sunday mornings, already been put off. It's, it's not just put off, it's put on a shelf. And your flesh doesn't ever want you to pick it up. So what it does is the flesh will convince your mind, would you, would you gather evidence to support that what I want is true? Your flesh will. Your flesh will convince your mind, would you gather evidence together? So your mind begins to gather evidence for your flesh, for your fleshly uh, uh, opposition to God's Word. Well, maybe God didn't really say that. Maybe it was just an emotional moment for you. you. You don't know the Word of God that well. You can't speak that well. Who are you to even think that God would say that to you? You're not the pastor. You're not the elder. You're not a deacon. Who, who do you think you are? Best for you to just sit down and shut up and just go along to get along. I mean, your mind will start collecting all of this evidence. What will they say if you started actually obeying that? What would, what would your boss say at work? What are your, what are your co-workers going to say, the ones you've been engaging in all of that, all of that coarse jesting and all of that, all of that nonsense talk that, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, but you've been joined in with that talk. What are they going to say now if you decide you're not going to be part of that anymore? They're going to think, who do you think you are? They're going to think you think you're something better than them. Your mind's going to start gathering all of this evidence. There you go. That's going to say, isn't it four months more and then the harvest? Can't we put this off to some other time? Someone calls you on the phone and says, hey, I want to invite you to the Father's house this morning. I heard you didn't go into church anywhere. Something in you says, I need to say yes to that. But your flesh says you absolutely don't want to go to the Father's house. You might actually hear the Word of God get saved. There you go. Your flesh says no. And so your mind starts gathering the evidence. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Saturday night, my son and, and my grandson went to the Texas Longhorn game yesterday evening. He told me, I said, what time do you get home this morning? He said, 1.30 this morning. So your excuse could be, well, you know, I got tickets to the Longhorn on Saturday night. I know we're going to get in late. There ain't no way I go to church. I get one day off a week. That's Sunday. So your mind's gathering all that evidence. You know, and it, it's going to be a pretty day Sunday. Stephen Furtick says it like this. He says, he says we, start, we start becoming meteorologists. We start forecasting the weather. What is a perfect day to go to church? For most Christians, well, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a day that's not perfect enough to go fishing, or not perfect enough to go hunting, or not perfect enough to stay in bed. It's raining this morning. Oh, I love the pitter pat of rain <laughs> on the roof. It makes me just want to pull the covers up around myself and not even get out of bed. That's right. I mean, our flesh, our flesh will start, I mean, our mind will start gathering all of the evidence our flesh needs for a real good reason to say, not today. <clears throat> not today. Mm -hmm. 
But today, this today, I pray for somebody in this room, today Amen. is today. Amen. Yeah. The mind just gathers evidence <clears throat> for the flesh, to support the flesh, so that we can either put off or say no to God. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 25, there was a man named Felix who worked for the Roman government, and Paul was standing before him to testify. And Paul says, as Paul talked about, the word says, as Paul talked about righteousness self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. In other words, this isn't an opportune time. This isn't the right time. Maybe if you came back in four months, maybe there'd be a harvest with my soul, but not today. I've got too much to do. I mean, I, I, I'm... I'm I'm really, really involved in a lot of things and, and in life right now. And, and, and I really don't see a place in a, in a time or, or a place for a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ or a commitment to a church. I, I, I've got so much going on. That's the mind gathering the evidence to support a verdict for the flesh. That's right. To not answer the call of God. So the mind gathers evidence to support the flesh. Now, number three. Number three is a tale of two storms. I'm talking about dealing with storms. Number three is a tale of two storms. When the word of God comes to you, be assured a storm does too. When God speaks to you specifically, speaks to you individually, Paul said, I find that good is present with me, but I also find that evil is present. I have this storm, this war inside of me. Can we just call that war a storm that Paul's talking about? It rages against his obedience to God. When I read that, I thought about Jonah's storm, the prophet Jonah. In Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. In other words, he got the letter, he got the memo, he got the email, he got the text. He heard from God. It came to him. He read it, he got it, it, didn't, it he didn't misunderstand it. And the word he got was, you go to Nineveh. <coughs> And you preach the word of God there. The problem was Jonah hated the Ninevites. He had good cause to hate the Ninevites. They had taken away this. That was a city of Assyria, the capital. And they had, they had defeated the northern kingdom uh, and carried off many of the captivity, killed many, carried the rest off into captivity. They had obliterated the northern kingdom called Israel. Jonah didn't have a place in his heart to carry this word out. Man, tell what his flesh was rebelling. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. You know what Jonah's mind began to do? Wait a minute. These are the guys that attacked our, our, our attacked Israel, and they were not merciful. In their attack. Many died. Many carried off into captivity. Many fled for their lives and never come back to live there again. There's no way you need to go speak to them. There's no way you need to go warn them of God's wrath to come. They don't need, they don't deserve that warning. His mind began to gather evidence to support his flesh, saying, Mm -mm, no way. Verses 3 and 4 says this. After he got this word, here's what he did. But Jonah went, ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And paying the fare, 
he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind, and we say storm, on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship was threatened to break up. So here's a storm that's coming after a man who has the word of the Lord but is running from its obedience. He's running away from doing what God has called him to do. And a storm comes. Remember I said, when you get a word from God, storms are coming. It's interesting to me that Jonah's situation is the opposite of the disciples' situation in Matthew chapter 14, where God gave them a word. The Lord Jesus Christ did, he said. He commanded them to get in their boat and go to the other side. He said, I'm going to go up on a mountain and pray. You go to the other side, I'll meet you there. So they've got a word, right? Go to the other side there, I'll meet you there. I need some time alone. <clears throat> this was after John the Baptist had been beheaded. Jesus, that was Jesus' cousin in the flesh. Jesus wanted to be alone, but people followed him out in the wilderness and they fed 5,000. I mean, Jesus didn't need some alone time, but he couldn't find any alone time. So now they fed the people. They'd gone away. He sends his disciples in the boat. Says, go to the other side. He goes up on a mountain to pray. They're obeying the Lord. And a storm came. The storm was after the word. The storm was after the word. Jonah's being disobedient. And he sees the storm as a way of escape. Because Jonah, when that storm came, he, he looked at those as the ship was being going to be broken up. It was that severe a storm that there was going to be a loss of life and everyone on that boat. And he says, hey, hey, guys. It's all my fault. <laughs> God's mad at me. Best thing you can do is just chuck me in the sea. And this storm will end because really this storm isn't about you. It's about me. Many times the storms that, that, that are coming after us affect others. If you're a mom or a dad in this room and, you, and you, you've been given a word by God and, or you've heard the word of the Lord, you know in your spirit that the, that, that the answer should be yes or amen. And you're here, you're representing a family, but you like Jonah are running from that word from God. It's not just affecting you, it's affecting everybody in your boat. It's affecting everyone in your boat. Jonah says, I am not taking that word to Nineveh. And he's running. He was so dead set on not, his heart, his mind, his flesh was so set on not delivering that word, he would rather die than take that word. But really what ought to happen in our hearts is, God, I will die if I don't deliver this word. That's right. Jeremiah said, your word is like a fire shut up in my bones. That very word that was in Jeremiah was about to cost him his life. They really thought when they cast Jeremiah into that, into that well that he would die there, but somebody rescued him. He was supposed to die in a well they cast him in because he spoke the word of the Lord. I mean, the moment Jeremiah began to speak God's word, no wonder his, he's called the lamenter. And he wrote not only, not only Jeremiah, but lamentations. Because when, when he spoke God's word, storms came against him. No, storms came in the, in, 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 the, in the form of people rising up against him with a storm of fury. And so Jeremiah had every right to say, God... I'm in this well. I mean, I spoke your word. Look what happens to me when I speak your word. But then he says, by faith, he says, however, there's a fire in my bones. Your word's like a fire in my bones. I can't contain it. I can't keep it inside. I have to speak it, even if it calls a storm forth. Yeah, That's right. Jonah was trying to get out of delivering God's word, and a storm came. And God used that storm to put him right back where he was supposed to be. 
Okay, maybe that boat isn't going to get me to Assyria, but there's a fish I've prepared. He'll take you there. I got a fish that's going to take you to them. Since you didn't want to get on the right boat, you want to run another direction, I got something under the sea. You could have floated on top of the sea. You could have been above the surface, but I got something under the surface that's going to swallow you, and you're still going to go where I'm telling you to go. Yikes. That's right. I want to ask Jonah someday, don't you? Man, what was it like inside that fish? <laughs> Gross. I mean, was it... Were you squashed in? Were, did you have room to move? Were you completely immobile? In your, in your letter you wrote to us, in the scripture you wrote, you said you were able to talk to God. I mean, we can talk to God outside the fish or we can talk to Him in the fish. I'd rather be outside the fish talking to Him. <laughs> Say, God, I may not want to go, but I'll go because you've said it. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's what Jesus said. See, a storm came against Jesus in the garden. A storm that the enemy had, had put together. And Jesus said, Lord, is there any other way that your will can be carried out? Is there any other plan? It's the only plan I know. This is what I've been walking towards all my life. But if there's another way, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. God, if, 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 if this includes a storm called the cross, if it includes a storm called scourging and mocking and beating and bleeding, God, I'll take the storm to do your will. See, it's not a matter of are you going to have a storm in your life. It's how are you going to deal with the storm. That's right. How are we going to deal with the storm? That's right. Jonah. God had to handle Jonah a different way. He had the word. He knew what the word was. He knew what he was supposed to say. He just didn't want to do it. And I suspect we have some Jonas in this room this morning. You know what God has said. But you were running the other way. You got on a ship bound for Tarshish. You're running the opposite direction. God said you can run. But how do, you, how do you run out of the presence of an online present God? How do you run away from a God who's everywhere? Think about that. How do you run away from a God who's everywhere? It's not easy. You ever see those horror movies? I didn't, just think of one. I don't, I'm not thinking of one right now, but but it seemed like everywhere the person that was trying to get away from whatever the evil entity was, everywhere they turned, that's there. They run through this door and there it is. They run through that door and there it is. Now our God's not evil; He's good. He's a good, good Father. But I'm tell you what: you can't run from Him. Amen. Not from His presence. You can run from His will, and you can choose not to do it. Come on. That's right. In Jonah's case, it was the mercy of God that a fish, had came, a fish came along and said, I'm not going to chew this dude, I'm just going to swallow him. <laughs> I'm going to incubate him until the word of God is ready to be spoken. Yeah. The Bible says that he was in that, in that fish three days and three nights. I don't know about you, but... Um, how many minutes would you need to be inside the belly of a fish and say, God, I surrender? Are you serious? I mean, you've got to have a pretty, a pretty uh, heart and heart against what God is saying to you to want to spend one minute in the belly of a fish. But you see, he was hoping he'd die. He'd rather die than do God's work. You know there are people all over this world right now that are dying. I don't mean necessarily physically, but they'd rather die spiritually than do what God tells them to do. They'd rather walk in death and destruction than to do what God said. They'd rather say, God, I, I, listen, you just find somebody, I'm not about to do this. You can do it in my life whatever you want to. We can be stubborn and obstinate, can't we? And when our flesh, when our flesh has set its heels against the Word of God, our mind will start supporting evidence to not do it. 
Jonah had plenty of ammunition. His mind had given him plenty of ammunition. But God said, Jonah, I don't care about what you think. <laughs> it's about what you think. Mm -hmm. See, we're going to do God's word. It's not about what you think. God will ask you to do things many times that your mind would never think of doing. Mm -hmm. Come on. God will ask you to put you in situations <laughs> to minister His Word to people you wouldn't even think about speaking to. Right. Yeah. So it's not about what you think. Because as long as your mind is set on the flesh, it will always offer an excuse to not do what God calls us to do. Mm -hmm. right. Asks us to do. We tend to think that God's, God's words are suggestions. And they're commands. Now we have this other storm. We have one storm with Jonah running from God. Running away from the word of the Lord which he's received. The disciples have the word of the Lord. And they are rowing towards it. They're going the exact direction that God has told them to go. They are moving Towards what God has spoken them to be. And yet a storm comes. It's interesting because when the storm comes, it's, it, you know, it could have got behind them, and the force of the winds could have pushed them and got them there twice as soon. See, winds aren't always bad, it just depends on what direction they're blowing. That's right. Because if you get a wind behind you for the direction you're going, that's a good thing. But if the wind is contrary to you, and they're rowing, they don't have motor boats, they're rowing. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 14 that the wind was contrary to them. It's like they're not making up any ground. I don't know if you've ever been in a boat like that. My friend and I, we were probably not real smart, but we got a little small John boat. The, the, the month after I graduated high school, he and I, and uh, I had my dad's little John boat. It was a small thing, and he happened to have a little, a little motor. I think it was about 10 horsepower or something. And we decided we were going to go up to Lake Texoma, just two of us, and camp out and fish. And we weren't meteorologists. We weren't weather watchers. And we got on Lake Texoma and that little 10 horsepower motor. And I don't know why we went so far from where we were camping. We went a long ways. And then the storms came. And we're trying to maneuver that little boat across that lake, across Lake Texoma <laughs> in a storm in a little room on a boat. <laughs> And it got pretty hairy, pretty scary. Isn't it interesting that, that, that Jesus said, meet me on the other side. And yet a storm comes that is contrary to their arrival where they're to go. When you're, walking, when you're running with God's word or you're running away from God's word, listen, you're still going to have to deal with a storm. That's right. That's right. They, they are going, they're doing God's will and the storm comes. Jonah's running from God's will and the storm comes. The difference is Jonah wanted to die, but they want to live. <laughs> they want to get there. Jonah doesn't want to get there. So he'll take death. It's amazing to me how hard the heart can, can be that it would rather choose death than life. That it would rather choose curses rather than blessing. God said, I've set before you both. I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse you choose. That's right. And so, they go ahead of him, like Jesus said, and they're in the boat, and they're going. You think Jesus didn't know about this storm? Sure he did. He was up on a mountain praying. You wouldn't look, those of you that have been to Israel, there's no way you'd be on high at the vantage point looking over the Sea of Galilee and not see a storm on the sea. You'd see it. It didn't surprise Jesus. May I suggest to you that when he sent them, he already knew the storm was coming. Jesus knows your storms. He knows they're coming when you're when you don't know they're coming. And they're doing everything they can. They're, they're rowing as hard as they can row. But the storm seemed to be prevailing. But you know the story. Jesus comes to them in a storm. That's right. And then Peter gets a word to. He says, if that's you, he was scared. They, they were scared. They saw what they thought was a ghost on the water. And they said, and they heard Jesus' voice. And Peter says, if that's you, bid me to come out. And, 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 and Peter steps out. He stepped out because of the word of the Lord. 
Not because the, the sea froze or the storm stopped, but because of the word of the Lord. See, if we have the word of God, and we're, when we're walking with the word of God, we will walk on that word, not the storm. We'll walk on that word, not even the, not even the, 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 the destruction that the storm brings. We will walk on the word. Yeah. The word will carry us through the storm. So we have two storms here. Jonah didn't deal with his storm very good. Jesus comes and rescues his disciples in the storm because he sent them in the storm. He sent them into that wind. And Jesus tells you that you're going to go to the other side and he'll meet you there. Stand on that. You will get to the other side no matter how, what, what it looks like getting there. If he... If he if it commands you to get there, you'll get there. Amen. Moses, I don't care how bad you talk. I don't care that you killed an Egyptian. I don't care that you're wanted for murder in Egypt. If you'll go with my word, I'll get you there and back out. Amen. And we're going to conclude with going back to the book of Romans and continuing on in chapter 8, beginning in verse 9. Oh, this all looks your spirit. He says, you, you. That's me and you. Amen. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. Amen. So we see things after the flesh with our natural eye, but we're in the realm of the spirit. If you see only with the flesh, can I tell you something? You're going to walk in fear all the time. That's right. If all you see is the flesh. If all you see is the natural. If all you see is that, you're going to walk in flesh all the time. Matter of fact, out of your mouth is going to be constantly coming. Fear and doubt, fear and doubt, fear and doubt, fear and doubt, fear and doubt. You're not in the realm of the flesh. You're in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Well, that's a novel idea, isn't it? It's like saying, if you haven't been born again by the Spirit, you're not really a believer. You may have accepted a creed. You may have accepted a form of religion. But you're not a believer. You're not, you're not one of Christ's until you've been born again and sealed by the Spirit of God. That's right, amen. It's not enough to say I belong to a church. I went through some teachings. I answered all the questions with the correct answer. You can do that and not have the Spirit of God. Amen. We can train a monkey on how to ring a bell. We can train a monkey to take a tin cup in his hand and walk around taking money from people. No, we can train humans on what to say, the right thing to say, and then tell them now you're part of God's church. But not according to the Word of God. He said if you don't have the Spirit, you don't belong to Christ. If Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. See, the flesh is always leading us to destruction. But if we have the Spirit of God and follow the Spirit, He's always leading us to life. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. But we don't worry about what about, about the death of the natural man. If you have the Spirit of God, hallelujah, you have a resurrection power in you. Amen. No grave's going to hold you down. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. Paul said, hey, we are obliged. We have an obligation. If we claim to be Christ. We have an obligation. What's that obligation to? It's not to the flesh. We're not obliged or obligated to live according to the flesh and its desires any longer. What we are obliged to is to walk in the Spirit. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body... You will live. How do we put to death the members of our body that are raging war, as Paul said, against 
the word of the Lord in us. Against obedience, against righteousness. How do we do that? He says it's a spiritual battle. You've got to put the flesh to death yeah. by the Spirit. Amen. Amen. That's how we do it. By the Spirit. It's not enough just to say, starting at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, I will no longer sin. <laughs> Doesn't happen that way. That's right. I'm going to start tomorrow being a good person. But this evil is present with you. The moment you... I, I wish I could get somebody to agree with me on this one. You can start tomorrow morning and say, tomorrow morning, I'm going to start a thousand calorie a day diet. Period. Can I tell you something? Because I've been there and done that. <laughs> oh, man, I'm telling you what, the pancakes look better. <laughs> the tacos look better. Yeah. Man, you just say it. This is my sheer willpower. I'm going to do it. And all of a sudden, even things that didn't look so good start looking good. Mm -hmm. You start denying your body food, and suddenly Brussels sprouts will look good. <laughs> well, some of you like Brussels sprouts, but can I just say, they're not the best taste of food. I don't care how you cook them. I'll eat them because they're healthy. And you can keep collard greens and turnip greens. I don't care how you cook those things. They taste bitter to me. But if I was, if I stayed, if I, if I didn't eat long enough, I'd probably eat some turnip greens. <laughs> In other words, when you've made up a decision, your mind, you said, you're, 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 you're telling your mind, tomorrow we're going to start eating only this, and your flesh will go, do what? Mind, what did, what did, whoa, 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 what did he just say to you? That tomorrow morning we're going to start no more bluebell? <laughs> No more brownies. Tomorrow morning, what your flesh is going to do? You're going to start envisioning blue milk. Holy moly. I mean, you're going to see brownies. You're, you're, this, you're going to concentrate on the things that, you're, that you just told yourself you can't have. Your mind will start gathering evidence to support your flesh. Your mind will say, you know what? Four more months and then the diet. <laughs> Because we got Thanksgiving around the corner. Why would I start a diet right now when Thanksgiving is just two months away? And then after Thanksgiving, it's Christmas. Why would I start a diet? Christmas, there's way too many parties at Christmas. Way too much study. Why would I start a diet then? I mean, there's a storm raging, isn't there? And then New Year's Eve passes. You go, now's the time. You go, yeah, I'm with Valentine's. <laughs> we got birthdays. What about, this, what about the church so-so we're doing? I mean, it's always something, isn't it? Your mind's gathering that evidence to tell your flesh, you're not starting a diet. And it's the same whenever God has spoken to your spirit. Start obeying my word. I've got things for you to obey. I've got a path for you to walk. If you just listen to me and your flesh goes, what? Mine? You're not really considering that, are you? Are you really considering to making, making a commitment to a local church? Well, you're, you're saying you're going to be there as often as you can? You're really going to make a commitment to that Sunday school class? Or you're going to make a commitment to that youth? You, you know how busy your life is. You don't have time for that. Four more months and maybe then. Mm. Yeah. Well, the storms yeah. start raging, don't yes, they? Yes, they do. The storms start raging. For those <laughs> who are led, here's the answer. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Amen. How do we overcome these storms? How do we overcome our minds gathering evidence to support our flesh and not support the Spirit? We have to fix our eyes on Jesus. We must be born again by the Spirit, filled, baptized with the Spirit, with His power. And then we set our affections on things above and not below. So that the things below only become the things that are necessary to attain the things above. Amen. That makes sense? In other words, we don't worship our car. Oh, I finally got my dream car. Oh, I'm going to spend all Saturday waxing and washing it and keep it clean. No, no, we see the car as a necessary means to get where we need to go with the Word of God. Come on. We don't worship our money. We don't worship our bank account. We see money as the means by which to attain or which the vehicle by which to do the will of God. Yeah. Yeah. So I can be a giver. Yeah. Amen. So we, 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 we bring it. We're not obliged to carry out 
the whims of the flesh. But we're committed to walk by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. And these are the sons of God. Amen. Those who put to death the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit yeah. and walk according to His promises. Would you stand? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I know a lot of ministry has already taken place today. But if anything has pricked your heart today and you just want to, you want to say, Pastor, I heard that word. It spoke to me. And I didn't just hear it. But I'm going to put it, it's going to become an operating, uh, an operating modus in my life. And let every head bow and every eye closed. I want to look around. If you just say, Pastor, that word spoke to me today. I want to be led of the Spirit. I'm tired of following the whims of my flesh. I want to be led of the Spirit. Just slip your hand up and you can put it back down. Yeah, amen. So that's me. I see that hand, yes. I see those hands all over the world. I see those hands. More importantly, God sees those hands. Truthfully, we all could have lifted our hand, couldn't we? Amen. God, I want to be led of the Spirit. I'm not obliged any longer. I'm not obliged to the flesh. So there has to be a renewing of our mind. Our mind has to be transformed. Come on. That's right. To listen to the Spirit and obey. Instead of following the desires of the flesh. And Paul said, I have this evil that's present with me. See, I can't say a prayer for you and have all the evil moved away from you. take evil out of the world. It's here. Till Christ comes again, evil is here. It's present with us. You can throw your computer away if the computer's your problem, but there'll be another computer in your future. That's right. That's right. So well, I'm just going to deny this affection. I'm just going to dig my heels and say no to it. That affection's not going to leave. You need to be controlled by the Spirit of God and led by the Spirit. The Spirit will cause you to walk in the affections, the affections of God, His desires. So, Lord, every hand that was lifted, oh God, and even those that, if you want me to pray for you right now, I can be part of this prayer. I know you're all going to hear it, but you want to say, Brother Tom, I really need this prayer. You say, I need to be led of the Spirit. I don't want to follow the flesh any longer. One more time, slip your hand up real fast. You put it back down. Well, Lord, all of those hands that have gone up, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, God. May we set our affections on things above. May we find joy in our King. Joy in a life dedicated to living it for you. Thank you that you give us everything that we need. That's what your word says. You give us every. All of you lift your hands up. Listen. His word says, I'll give you everything you need for a life of godliness. Amen. I'll not withhold anything from you if you'll just set your mind on me. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. When your mind tries to gather evidence and justification for your flesh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, You take those thoughts captive. They are exalting themselves against the knowledge of the Word of God in you. You take them captive. You say, Mine, we're not going to think on those things. We're not going to dwell on those things. But Paul said in the book of Philippians, he said, Whatsoever things are lovely and trustworthy and praiseworthy and good and holy, think on these things. Meditate on these things. Set your mind under the obedience of the Holy Spirit. Set it free from your flesh. If you'll offer yourself a living sacrifice unto God. And not be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to the lust of your flesh. In other words, don't let your flesh shape and mold you. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That comes from knowing the word of God and hearing his voice. He said, you'll know what the true perfect will of God is for your life. 
that's a promise. Everyone say amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. To all of our guests, we thank you for being here today. If you're looking for a church home, we invite you to be part of the Father's house. We'd love to have you here. God bless you.